it will show up on the different platforms. You can also see us on YouTube. And we're on Clear Skies Network. Okay. The other ones, Facebook and all that, I'm not going to worry about right now. Okay, we're just getting set up, folks. You're watching a stream. You're seeing us, but I'm still pushing buttons because this is a actual podcast recording, and they we're just going to interact with you with a live stream. So, all right, I'm going to hit the recording button. Now I think I am recording audio, and we're back. Okay. Okay, very good. Checking everything. Let me pull up my chat window. All right. Hey, Gregorius, I see you there on YouTube. <laughs> okay, I'm still getting a little bit set up here. I'm just streaming. You're seeing a little behind the scenes stuff here while I make sure everything is working. Molly is with me. Yeah, okay. hosting and running the stream at the same time is really difficult. <laughs> <but> I, <laughs> I've been doing this since, well, you remember, what was it, Google Hangouts? When did that come out? Was that 2011? Uh, um, I'm not sure when it actually like came out, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's when it started for me, right? I was like doing Hangouts. I was working at, at the uh, Institute at the time, and we all wanted to live stream, and so we started doing it from there. With Alberto Conti, my good friend, and I, I miss him. But we, we, those were the days we started back with just Google Hangouts on Air, is what it was called. Yeah, at the time. And now we used to do that on the Astro Imaging Channel, uh, and then now we've moved over to to Google Meet. Uh, yeah. After <laughs> a brief stint in what uh, what else did we use? I don't remember something else that Google killed. I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so we, they've, they've killed a lot of stuff. So yeah. They bring it on when you get all excited. The only thing I never got excited about was Google Plus. Um, yeah, uh, you know, I, I tried it, and I was on there mainly. I used to, I was I'm an Ingress player, and uh, which is the the first augmented reality game that came before Pokemon, and uh, they did all their stuff on G Plus to try and and promoting class, but it just never really stuck with anybody. It, no, no. And it turned into a real spam machine. I mean, that was just like oh, all yeah. these links just into, well, I had a deep astronomy page and it just ended up getting crazy. So you had to have moderators and I had some people who worked really hard on the deep astronomy page to keep it clean, but it was a lot of work. And uh, then I, I just think everybody lost interest, including uh, Google. So yeah, that's, that's, that's where the humble beginnings of my doing all these hangouts started and live streaming. And I've been doing it ever since. So um, I want to let everybody know watching the stream that uh, we are streaming on my YouTube uh, channel as well as uh, Facebook, Twitter, uh, the Clear Skies Network on Twitch and the Deep Astronomy Twitch channel as well. And I'm looking at all of the uh, all of the uh, chats from all of those platforms. And so if you have any questions or comments you'd like to talk about while we're streaming and or recording, then please let us know and I'll be happy to uh, read them out already. T Hammer is going, hello, I have an old Mead Starfinder 10 inch telescope and plan on using it to take pictures of the conjunction. How should I clean the mirror? That is a great question. Um, and I will get to that as soon as I start the podcast. <laughs> so uh, Molly's on hand and she will talk to us about it. Um, uh, so that will, we'll get started. So looking around, okay. Got this going. I am recording. Just want to double check that I'm recording. Okay, yes. All right. And we will get started. Hello, everybody. Oh, and one more thing I want to say <laughs> before I actually start the podcast. <laughs> and, that, and that is that Dustin called me uh, and he's unable to make this uh, podcast. So it'll be just uh, Molly and me today uh, talking about uh, uh, astroimaging and all kinds of other things, being uh, studying to be a physicist and, and things that uh, uh, we hope you'll find interesting. But unfortunately, Dustin couldn't make it. Dustin, we miss you, but he will be back tomorrow uh, where we will... Uh, I think we're still on, on track to stream and talk about top 10 buys for astronomers uh, for Christmas. So uh, hopefully we'll be doing that one tomorrow afternoon. Okay, now let's get started. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Space Junk Podcast episode. Today I have with me Molly 
Wake, Wakeling. She is an astro imager and a uh, also working to uh, become a, 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 a working physicist in the field of, of uh, science. And uh, she has made quite an impression on uh, the astro, uh, the amateur astronomy community, especially with her imaging work. And she's got a lot of great gear. And some, and we're going to show you and talk about some of these things, uh, some of the stuff that she's been into. But let me just welcome you. Welcome, Molly. Hi, glad to be here. Yeah, thank you. Uh, really glad you took time out to talk to us about uh, some of this stuff. So, you got into astroimaging from base. Oh, uh, let me just give you a couple of ways to reach her. You can get to her at uh, astromolly.com. Her website Astron is astronomolly.com. Yeah. Astro what did I say? Astro what did I say? Uh, yeah, astro uh, astronom <laughs> astronomolly.com. I don't know quite sure what. It is. And here is a picture of it here. Uh, this is her uh, website. She. You can also follow her on Instagram at uh, astronomali underscore images. She's uh, got a lot of pictures of her gear and some awesome solar stuff, which I'm going to talk to you about as well. Uh, and uh, you can also um, you can also uh, follow her on on Twitch and uh, I'm sorry on Twitter uh, and uh, other social media channels. I'll put the links to all those in the description of this podcast. So uh, yes, yeah, so I wanted to let you guys know how to reach her. So you, according to your website, as I was reading uh, up on this uh, and, and about you to get some background, you're pretty new to the hobby of amateur astronomy, aren't you? Yes. Yeah, I just yeah. got started uh, back in July 2015. Yeah. So, I mean, how and why? Tell us the story. <laughs> what, did, it just, did it just pop out of nowhere? So, you know what? I think I need to become an astro amateur. Because if you no. listen to Dustin very much, that's how a lot, all everybody decides they're going to do this. <laughs> <laughs> it almost kind of came out of nowhere. Uh, I received a a, uh, a Celestron telescope and Altaz mount as a gift from a uh, from a, a, a then boyfriend. <laughs> uh, uh -oh. <laughs> <long> story. <laughs> okay, we won't go uh, there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and um, you know, I, I took it out. I I've been asking for one when, uh, the whole time I was growing up because I've been to astronomy as a science like my whole life, as far as I can remember. But I uh, we never had enough money for one when I was growing up, and so when I got this one in 2015, I. When I we took it out for the first time and I followed the directions, got it aligned, and then put it over on Saturn and just about fell over with how incredible Saturn looked through this eight inch Schmidt Cassegrain and just how like a picture it looked. <laughs> and I at it's first all, I called it's my always up. Go ahead, uh, yeah. I'm sorry. I guess I, uh, first I, I called my friends over to be like, you guys have to come see this, you know, that I brought out some of my friends with me to the local state park and uh, they looked at it. And then my second thought was, I have to get a picture of this so that I can share it with all my friends on all social media. And I, I had a DSLR and I figured out that there's a device I could use to connect my DSLR to the telescope. And then I was able to start taking pictures, and it's all kind of downhill from there. <laughs> <It's> downhill. <laughs> it's, it's, it's this chasm that you fall into, right? The, the money like pit the that you fall into. <laughs> Definitely a money pit, that's for sure. It's it's always Saturn, isn't it? I mean, yes. I love to be, I've said this many times, I love to be the guy with the telescope that you that you show a complete stranger for the first time who's never looked through a telescope the planet Saturn. I love to be that guy because there's always, the reactions are always the same. It's just like, Oh my God, that's amazing. It looks just like in the pictures and yes. it does. It's one of those few things you could look at through an eyepiece of a telescope that is reasonably familiar from all the pictures that you've seen, right? If you look at some of these other things like galaxies or nebulae and stuff through an eyepiece are just little faint smudges. Uh, but, uh, but Saturn, Saturn never disappoints. So that's what got you into it and a telescope from an X. Uh, yeah. And then, uh, and then, and then you, as you say, you fell into the uh, money abyss. So, did you just start? so it was it, it was, sounds like it was imaging though, that really got your heart, right? That's what really yes. captured you. And so yeah, I've always, I, eyepiece is not so much. No, I've always been a shutter bug and it's just like an extension of that basically. <laughs> Uh huh. Yeah, uh, Chris Georgie is commenting. It all starts with a C mount adapter. Then it's projection <laughs> eyepieces. Then field flatteners. Then guide scopes. Then auto guiders. <laughs> dot dot dot. Oh yeah, yeah, it goes on. <laughs> yeah, very true. So, um, 
Yeah, it's always it always starts humbly enough, but then it never quite ends that way. Mm -hmm. So, so you've been at this for roughly five years or so, and boy, you really going uh, looking at your looking at your website. By the way, for those of you who are listening to the uh, podcast on the audio, uh, I am. Uh, you need to go to astronomali.com. That's where a lot of her stuff is that I'm showing here on the stream. I mean, look at I mean, look at this gear. This is like here. Let me make it big for the stream real quick. Um, so yeah, I mean, this you've got uh, your primary make rig according to this is a, is a C8 with a Paramount Mighty mount. <laughs> Uh, that is yes. no slouch of a mount. Let me make that, see if I can make that bigger. There we go. Well, and that's the same. That's that's that first telescope that I talked about. Uh, I'm, I've now got it repurposed as an imaging rig. Ah, oh, yeah. The, and the, what do you, how do you like this mount? Tell us about this mount, this pair oh, it's fabulous. Yeah. So this this is, uh, after struggling with, with some Celestron mounts that had been, uh, like my uncle gave me a Celestron CGE, was kind of my first like big step up in astrophotography and after struggling with that and struggling with the CGE Pro, that's another story. Um, I finally decided I just wanted to get a mount that actually just worked and didn't have really weird problems all the time. So saved up my money and got the Paramount Mighty and it's phenomenal. It's uh, the mount just works great and it's been a joy to use. And do you also have a filter wheel on the back of this? I do, yeah. I've got a couple of things hanging off the back of there. I've got a, a filter wheel because I have a monochrome camera on there. So I've got my red, green, blue filters. I have uh, sure. two narrowband filters in there now, hydrogen and oxygen. Uh, and then I have a light pollution filter as well as my luminance channel. And is that a DSLR sitting off to the side? Uh, no, that's actually that's actually a, uh, a, a cheap, old, old Mead camera that somebody passed along to me. And it's, I actually just use it as a context camera to see if there's clouds or not. Oh, okay. Awesome. And uh, this is another one of your uh, 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 rigs. It looks like a Takahashi to me, a Takahashi for APO. Yes, that is a Takahashi. So I need, actually need to go update the webpage because I have a new mount for that rig. I have an Ioptron SEM40 now. Uh, uh -huh. And the Takahashi... I ordinarily wouldn't have purchased that awesome of a telescope at this point, but I bought it from my uncle, the same uncle who gave me the Celestron CGE at a nicely discounted price. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nice. And these, uh, and what, and uh, here is, uh, I don't have, I, I lost the captions on this one. What am I showing now? So this is my science rig. So in addition to my two imaging rigs, I have a rig dedicated to doing scientific observations. So primarily I do variable star observing for the American Association of Variable Star Observers. And I'm getting into exoplanet observing with NASA JPL's Exoplanet Watch program. Although I haven't had time to learn their processing software yet because grad school keeps me pretty busy. <laughs> Exo, well, say that again, Exo, Exo Watch? Uh, Exoplanet Watch is Exoplanet. the name of the program. I've not heard of that. Tell me about that. What is that? So uh, it's uh, so you can you think that the exoplanet watch the exoplanet observations are left to big space telescopes or stuff like that, but actually amateurs contribute a lot of data on transiting exoplanets. We look for the for the light curves, the little dips uh, when a planet eclipses its host star, and amateurs can do this with amateur equipment. And they have a, some software that they're about ready to release from beta into a release version called Exotic that does the data reduction and generates the plots and uh, does a lot of a lot of that heavy legwork of, of all the math. Oh, wow. Uh, That's really exciting. That's really exciting because, I mean, I know that imaging is your passion and that you're, you're very much into imaging. And I, I'm, if anybody who's listened to this podcast for any length of time knows I'm primarily a visual observer. I like to use eyepieces. And, but the future, I think, of the hobby of amateur astronomy is going to be in things like this, where amateurs are contributing scientific data to not just NASA, but to you know any number of scientific databases that are out there. And I think this is going to be an area where once you get all the pictures taken that you want of the Ring Nebula and M87 and all of these, you know, M51 and all of the Messier objects, this is where you can make some, I think, real amazing contributions to science. And so I, I'm going to have to now learn more about this because I think it's amazing. There are already people in our community here, Mike Aitke and uh, Mike Forsland, uh, Asteroid Hunters and uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the uh, Worldwide Variable Star Hunters. Uh, they, um, 
they are doing this kind of thing, right? Uh, Mike Forsland for Asteroid uh, uh, Hunters is doing astrometric uh, analysis on, on near-Earth objects and putting them in the Atlas database. And Mike uh, Aiki is also doing uh, test follow-ups uh, for our uh, Kepler objects of interest. So, um, and and I and you alluded to this at the beginning. You're right. You, you, the uh, I think these space telescopes that we have up there that have been finding exoplanets like Kepler and 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 tests uh, now. Um, that's just the beginning, right? That's yes. these are objects of interest. These are not confirmed exoplanets. These are things that might be. And take it takes a lot of follow up observations, and those are usually done from the ground. Yes. And I and until now, it looks like stuff like this. So, do you have any sense of what the data flow is going to be like? Are you just going to be sending data from your from your uh, telescope to NASA via this software? So, uh, the the way that for both, for both the AAVSO and for the Exoplanet Watch, uh, you you do. Some of the analysis you do the uh, like translating your images to the actual data points of of what the brightness value of a star is yourself, but using their software. Like I don't have to go and write my own code. Uh, I use I use their code, uh, but then I submit those observations to those organizations and and their scientists and actually anybody uh, like for the AAVSO anybody can can download variable star data from there and, and do their own analysis. Uh, but a lot of professional astronomers use that data as well to supplement what they have from the professional telescopes. The, the big professional telescopes, they th there's a lot of competition for time on those and they can't monitor every star every night. And that's where the amateurs come in because we have no such restrictions. We can image whatever we want on whatever night we want. So uh, it's a, amateurs contribute a huge amount of data to our understanding of exoplanets and uh, uh, yeah, exoplanets and variable stars, and uh, and even oftentimes discovering supernovae as well because of our ability to do the targets that we want on the nights that we want. I know, and uh, 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 Twitch streamers like Econ Greg are doing similar things with uh, supernova research. So yeah, these are to me this is going to be a boon. Uh, to professional astronomy, uh, all yes. having all of this extra data because you're absolutely right. These ground-based observatories are highly oversubscribed, and the competition to use them is fierce. And you can't just go to the to the telescope planning committee and say, "Yeah, I want to do some follow-up observations for I don't know four years on this uh, Kepler object of interest, so that I can get light curves on a on a on an exoplanet that has a." one year, <laughs> you know, okay. orbit, right? So, so, uh, and, and that's what it would take. You would need observations of these long period uh, exoplanets un to cover years to be able to fully uh, get a good sense of what that, that solar, uh, that stellar system is like. I mean, Kepler was up nominally for five years. It ran for seven and then it ran for a couple of years more as K2. And they were that was they did it for that long for a reason. They stared only at one section of the sky for a really long time for five years, so that they could get these long period exoplanets. Because TESS is only looking at sections of the sky for a couple of months, mm -hmm. and so it's already biased towards short period exoplanets. Right. These are planets that are very close to the star, and they they orbit really fast, and and uh, you can see their year in just a couple of days. So uh, that's not ideal for finding you know life giving exoplanets. So this kind of work exactly. I think is huge. Well, thank you for letting me know about that. I'm excited. I want to learn more about it. So this is a pretty new program then, as far as you know. Yes, the Exoplanet Watch program is, is pretty new, and their their software um, they're just about to release the the, the code um, for people to use to do their data reduction. So that's very new. Do you know what it takes to get involved? Uh, it's just an email to Rob Zellum, actually. So if if you Google uh, NASA JPL Exoplanet Watch or even just Exoplanet Watch, the website has his email on the front page, and you say, "Hey, I'm interested in getting involved." He'll add you to our Slack channel. And that's pretty much all it takes to get involved. <laughs> oh, cool. Okay. Well, I'm doing that right now while you're talking. Um, so uh, you mentioned um, you mentioned Avso. I want to talk just a little bit about 
that because that to me i have that i participated in that so back in the 70s mm -hmm. and back in the day what you had to do is you actually used your eyeball and they actually right, gave you yeah. a little <laughs> method for calibrating your eyeball so right. that when you gave a reading <laughs> <laughs> of a variable star mm -hmm. brightness, it actually meant something. Um, so uh, things have changed quite a bit. How long have you been involved in APSO? So I I just started doing work for them. Uh, just, let's see. So I started taking observations last November, so about a year ago. Um, and I, I got involved as an AAVSO ambassador. And we're trying to recruit a wider variety of people into astronomy in general and AAVSO in particular. Uh, a lot of uh, like women and younger people and, and other minorities that aren't as represented in astronomy into it. And the uh, so I started taking observations for them last November. I've had a couple of fits and starts as my gear has failed and I get stuff fixed and kind of get things going. But uh, yeah, that's, that's about the time I got involved with them. So not real long. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a great organization, guys. If you go listening and watching here, get involved. AAVSO, I just say ABSO, um, <laughs> but maybe that's not the right way to do it. I don't know. Anyway, they variable, that's the American Association for Variable Star Observers, and they've been around forever taking yes. uh, data uh, to understand the variability of stars that change their brightness. So definitely check into them. And they do still accept visual observations, if that's, if that's what you oh, like do to do. Oh, do they? Do. <laughs> they do, yeah, and they're not as accurate as the camera ones, but they are used no. still in in uh, in research, and they do still accept those for pretty much all targets, unless oh. the variability is really tiny. So. <laughs> wow. Well, I'm pretty hardcore visual guy, but I'm not that hardcore. Even I don't want to do that. <laughs> um, I would I would rather just automate that process and have and yes. have a calibrated CCD uh, readout yes. telling me, oh, this is you know this many counts on your camera. This is what you submit. <laughs> so yeah, it's a lot. Okay. It's a lot easier, I think. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, talk about some of the challenges uh, that you faced in learning how to take images with your telescopes when you got started. You s just a f the short time I've spent with you, uh, you seem like the kind of person who just dives in and just devours whatever topic is is interested in interesting in you uh, to you and so i i am i have this image of you going wow i want to take these pictures and then you just focus on it like crazy until you've understood everything there is to know is that is that how it went or was it some other kind of path that you took for that's pretty accurate i i would say uh, that i'm definitely obsessed with astrophotography, and I say that in a very literal sense. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're not alone. You're among friends here. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I really just dove into it. I, I uh, being a being a physicist, I, I'm I'm very much on the experimental side. I love messing around with with gear and just um, trying different things until it works. I just iterated over a lot of nights and got some help from people in my astronomy club. Did some searches on forums when I had particular problems and just kept trying and trying and trying. And over the course of the last five years, just continued to learn and continued to just try every kind of combination of gear I could think of. And then also learning the software side of it, uh, which the, the whole hobby is, is very challenging. There's a lot of technical aspects, both in hardware and in software that you have to know and, and learn deeply in order to make good astro images. And learning both of those that's that, that's the that's my bread and butter that's the kind of stuff that i love to do is diving real deep into into hardware and learning software and learning the science and stuff like that uh, but it it i just iterated over it so many nights um my last let's see last night was observing night number 449 i think over the last five years <laughs> so <laughs> uh, I, I do keep a log of, of all this um yeah and i just tried and tried and tried again until i got it I'm still trying. <laughs> Do you think that, uh, so Dustin and I often make the case on this podcast that, you know, it has never been easier to get into the hobby and from an imaging perspective with telescopes like Stellina and the EV scope uh, that are coming out or that they've come out this year. Uh, and even with the other telescopes and the cameras that are available uh, with from Mead and Celestron, that imaging the the barrier to understanding and entry to imaging has gotten a lot lower. 
but I get the feeling that you don't think that's enough, that there must be a, there, there's a, once you've taken a few images for a, you know, a few seconds and you've stacked some nice little Orion uh, Nebula images that it, there's really a lot to be gained from diving deep into your, both your gear and to the code, right? Yeah, and it depends on what your goal is. If if you just want, to, uh, if you're really like an, an observational person and just want to enjoy those views yourself, being able to see more of a target with the camera than you can with your eye, then the the level of of technical knowledge you need, both on the hardware and the software side, is a lot lower because you're just making images that look okay enough for you to look at. But if you if you if you're striving to produce incredible images of these deep sky objects and go after things that are not as much imaged, then you really have to dive deep into the hobby to sort out all the all the multitude of problems that come with using advanced hardware and software. But I'd still say the barrier to entry, just to, just to get your feet wet, is pretty low because the yeah. uh, I, I used a DSLR, so a camera that uh, you can use for daytime photography as well. They're not super expensive and uh, a mount that didn't track very well at all to get started and got some early images back. And with, with the digital cameras, you can just throw away the frames that aren't good, as opposed to back in the film days where you would sit there for five hours and try and like keep your, your telescope rock solid steady and you know one, one wrong move or an airplane going through can ruin your exposure. Today, you just throw out the bad exposures and, and process the good ones and you get a nice image out of it. That's right. And, and it's, uh, it's a lot of it's automated. So you just get out there, turn a bunch of switches and you next thing you know, you're taking images all over again. So yeah, the bad old days of film, I, I remember it well. Uh, well, uh, <laughs> well, what software do you typically use when you're processing your images? So for processing, I, well, I started with Deep Sky Stacker, which is a, a piece of free software that is just your basic stacking. You know, if you're just, just getting started, don't know how into it you want to get, don't necessarily want to put out a lot of money yet, uh, you can use Deep Sky Stacker to stack some images in and see what your final image can, can look like. And then I started taking those images and put it, running them through Photoshop to do a little more cleaning up and, and making them look nice. But then I, Pix and Sight's really kind of the, the, the pinnacle for uh, ast astrophotographers. And there's some other software suites out there, but um, a lot of people yeah. really are, like Pix and Sight. I love Pix and Sight. It's extremely powerful, has a very steep learning curve, but it's extremely powerful image processing software. Yeah, what would you say, uh, how long did it take you to really get comfortable with Pix and Sight? Um, it took me probably about a year to get to get really comfortable with it to the point where now I'm developing my own workflows and, and being able to tweak settings and combine different aspects of, of a workflow together to, to have an effect. Um, like I've figured out how to like reduce the blue halos around stars on my own using some methods I learned on doing some other techniques. Um, so yeah, I, I think it took me about a year to get, to get comfortable enough with it, to start doing my own things. Would you mind explaining to the beginners that are listening and watching here uh, why what is stacking and why yeah. is it a good thing? So when you take a single image, if you've ever tried to plug a, a camera into a telescope and you took an image and you were disappointed, you look at it and you see like, there's nothing here. It's mostly black. It's very noisy. What's <laughs> going on? And you might stop there because <laughs> you know, it doesn't look like those ones that you see on, on the NASA astrophoto of the day. You know? That's um, right. But that's, that's just the first step. What you're doing with stacking is you're using the power of statistics to bring out what is really a very dim object. You know, if you look at it with your eye, you know how dim it is. And these things are thousands or even millions of light years away. That light is messed up by the atmosphere and is limited by the capabilities of your camera. And it'll, it'll come out as a dim, noisy image. But when you take dozens of these or hundreds of these and, and stack them, which is really a, st a statistical process uh, mainly it's really averaging you're averaging them and that increases the signal which is the like your target is the same in every frame but the noise is is random in every frame so by by adding a bunch of images together and averaging them your signal goes up your noise goes down and you have an image where you can actually see this really dim nebula that you can't even see with your naked eye 
And yeah, so you're, you're using the power of math to make pretty images. So one thing I've always asked and wondered about is, uh, is it better to take a whole bunch of short exposure images and add them together or take just a few really long exposure images and add them together? Yes, that's Which a fascinating gives better results. Yeah, and you know it depends on the camera and, and the telescope setup you have. These days with the new CMOS technology, taking many short exposures has actually started to yield better results because of the characteristics of the CMOS camera. Uh, back in the early days of using CCD chips, taking fewer longer exposures was the way to go. But now you can take, I, I've seen people where they've taken thousands of one second images on, so it has to be a fairly bright target to use this method uh, on like the dumbbell nebula or the ring nebula and using that as a way to beat the atmospheric blurring to get really sharp images of these planetary nebula. So I kind of strike a middle balance. I take uh, dozens of five minute images, generally three or five minute images and kind of kind of split the difference because the more images you have, the better your signal to noise ratio is going to be because of, uh, of the laws of statistics. Uh, but right. the longer exposures gather more photons per, per image, so it's a bit of a balancing act. Right. For the for the, for the nerds out there, the number the signal goes up by the number of images that you take, but the noise only goes up by the square root of the number of images right. that you take. So you right. get much better signal to noise the more you take. That's uh, right. So that's that's why people do it. It also depends a lot, I think, on your mount. Right. Yes. If you've got yeah. a sort of a dodgy mount and maybe one that maybe your optics are stellar, your camera is outstanding, but maybe your mount's got a lot of periodic error, or maybe it's not so great aligned, uh, you might want to take some minute or so, maybe two exposures, because anything longer than that, you'll start to get to star trails or errors in your mount might start to show up uh, on the longer exposure ones. That might be another reason why you might want to just take shorter exposure ones. I don't know. Yeah, my, my first mount, the the one, uh, my very first telescope rig, I could only take about 20 second long exposures on it uh, before I started losing a lot of frames to tracking error. Uh, so I just, um, well, this is before I, I knew to take tons and tons of exposures, but now I have mounts that track for much longer, but then you get limited by the light pollution and that limits That's the right. length of exposure you can take as well. The sky background can be a real huge source of noise. And so, uh, yeah, dark skies are never, the importance of those never goes away. Yes. Um, okay, I'm seeing a lot of your questions, and I promise you, Richard, I'm going to ask them to, uh, to Molly. Um, I just want to, before I start on the question part of this, I want to talk a little bit about um, your studies. Um, you are a graduate student uh, studying to be a physicist. Can you tell us a little bit about that story what how did you get there from did and and did you decide to do this after you just became an amateur astronomer or was it always something you wanted to be so um i've i've definitely always been into science although my hometown of spokane washington didn't have a lot of scientific extracurricular activities it's not really a not a lot of, of technology industry in spokane so I just, I just read a lot about it, watched a lot of Magic School Bus, watched a lot of Nova, and spent <laughs> most of my time, uh, spent most of my energy in, in music and on the debate team. Uh, so some decidedly non-science things, but I, I really liked science. And I, when, I, when it came to choosing my undergraduate degree, I, I was trying to decide actually between going into science and engineering or going into music. <laughs> oh, really? An interesting. <laughs> actually, <yeah. And laughs> It was, it was a hard decision, but I figured I could always do music on the side, but doing science on the side is more difficult. So I decided yeah. to go with the science route and I don't do as much music on the side as I, as I would like, but you know, we only have so many hours in the day. Um, so uh, what kind of instrument and or did you sing or was it an instrument that you wanted to get into? What was the music part of it? So I played cello and piano growing cello. up and then, yeah, I was in orchestra and I, I took up piano lessons. And then when I was in high school, I started playing vibraphone in marching band. And then in college, I picked up flute in marching band. Ah, uh, okay. And so, but, <laughs> but, but, physics, but physics won out, thankfully. Um, yeah. And so presumably, now that you're a grad student, you started as an undergrad. Um, what was that experience like for you as a, as, and, and I'd, like, I'd like to maybe, if you could couch your answer in kind of a way that gives us some insight into what it's like to be a woman going into a science field that 
historically had been relatively male dominated, but isn't so much now. Uh, what did you experience anything specific to that as you were making your rounds in the undergraduate world? Mm -hmm. So uh, having having grown up a Girl Scout, I was always reinforced with kind of the idea of, you know, you can do anything you want to do and that that mm -hmm. whole um, kind of millennial mindset. <laughs> and, <laughs> uh, <laughs> and I loved being the weird one, I guess. I when I was in in fourth grade is, is I remember the very day I decided to be a nerd and that that's what that's what God I, bless you, Molly. God <laughs> bless you. <laughs> you know, it's, it was I a love the nerds. Between, I uh, like I was get start at that point at that age I was starting to get worried about looking too much like a like a teacher's pet or you know uh, but I loved <laughs> helping my friends with their math homework and I finally decided you know what I love helping my friends with their math homework so I'm just gonna do that and forget about what anybody thinks about it you know <laughs> and so that's kind of the mindset that I you know that evolved as I was growing up and I love the idea. Uh, so I, I like to like when I go to conferences, I, you know, wear a skirt and dress up nice. And I want to kind of be the antithesis of the normal idea of what a scientist looks like. And I love doing that and kind of breaking people's expectations on purpose. <laughs> oh, no white stock, no white socks with Birkenstocks, huh? And uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and unruly hair. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> See more than my share of those guys at the conferences. <laughs> <I'm sure. laughs> yeah. to, to be fair, though, to be honest, uh, I've gotten pretty much nothing but support from the professors I've had, my classmates, and my, my classmates now in grad school. And I think that cultural shift is happening. And the people I've worked with and the professors I've had, uh, I've had the fortunate experience of not being one of those people who was told you shouldn't do physics because that's not something that women do. Although I know many women who have literally had people say that to them in those words. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> that still happens. So you, but yeah. So not, but not you, you haven't really had not that. Me, yeah. Yeah. That's really great. I think that's really maybe awesome. just the force of my personality. People didn't question it. <laughs> well, I don't know though. I think maybe you're right. I think maybe things are changing a little bit. You always, it been my day, which is, you know, ancient times, the, the, you know, that was an issue, right? It was like, well, girls just don't do that, right? What are you doing? And only now are we starting to recognize the women from the 40s, the 50s, and the 60s who actually made real contributions. The Vera Rubin Observatory, for example, right. is an acknowledgement of some really amazing work done by somebody who actually pro proposed dark matter before anybody else was thinking about it. And of course, all the women uh, involved with uh, the NASA, the, the movies we've seen from the NASA years uh, with Apollo and everything else. So, you know, there's been, women have always been involved. The women have always been in science and in most cases, making the most important contributions. But it's this culture that I think has finally started to change. I mean, Jocelyn Bell with the Pulsars, uh, you yeah. know, finally you know, took her a while. And, uh, you know, going even further back to Marie Curie and all those, she was the most famous, I think, for a long time. But, yeah. you know, there were people involved in the early days of atomic energy and nuclear physics where, you know, these were women, these were be being make making valuable contributions. So they've always been there. Mm -hmm. It's just <laughs> they've not been getting the either the credit or the recognition of their work up until I think now, do you agree with that? Do you think things are, are changing as far as the recognition level goes of the yes. work you're doing? Yes. And I think the, the more women who get up to those uh, higher levels of, of being professors and being in charge of organizations, then the younger women coming behind them can see themselves in those positions and want yeah. to, and feel like they they belong more to the community when they can see somebody who is like themselves in that role, and that goes for for race as well. And yeah. yeah, so that representation is is really important, and that's why I I try to get out and do as much outreach as I can just to be an example for both women and men. Of here's an example of somebody who is a scientist, and uh, hey, you know she's like like me. I could see myself doing that in a little more of a subconscious way, but. <laughs> Yeah, and that's why I think the recognition is important. I mean, yes, you can do the work throughout the history of science. Women have done the work and not gotten the recognition, but it's important for the very reason you just said, that we recognize that work as mm -hmm. being done by the people who actually did it, women in this case, uh, because you do need to be able to see yourself as a child or as somebody aspiring to do this, that there are people before you 
who have made these moves and are making good contributions. And it's an affirmation that you can do it too. So I think, I think that I'm, I, I'm glad that this is finally, that this is finally starting to happen with respect to the, um, recognition factor, especially, um, you mentioned your outreach and I just, and I put up a, a comment from Hugo Burnham who, who says that, you know, keep up the outreach, Molly, you're an inspiration. What do you do? What, what sort of outreach do you do? So before COVID, I would volunteer with my astronomy club often to, we would do a lot of uh, sidewalk astronomy type events where we would host stargazes out at the state park, or we actually did a lot of, of stargazes at, at local breweries. <laughs> <laughs> As yeah, so I used to say, uh, come see the stars while you're seeing stars. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yeah. <laughs> Things so are really of- starting to whir- rotate now. <laughs> 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 yes. Wow. I'm like rotating with that galaxy. This is really right, great, yeah. man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so I go out with, I'd bring my telescope out and, and set it up with other members of my astronomy club. And we would show people the planets and sometimes some other targets like globular clusters or some of the brighter galaxies. And a lot of people, and they've never had a chance to see something like that and to feel that connection to the universe and to look at that, at that splotch in there and, and realize that that light has been traveling for millions of years to finally reach their eyes. And as astronomers, we get to experience that all the time. But for the general public, that's, that's just not something that a lot of people have really considered or thought about. And it opens up their worldview. And uh, I, I've even had, I had, one uh, gentleman come through who had a young daughter who was about three, four years old. And um, he said, you know, I've been teaching her all about lady scientists. And I said, well, I'm a lady scientist. <laughs> <laughs> we <were> so excited. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> you, know, like, just, you know, being that example. And also did a, yeah. I do a lot of stuff with scouts. I did uh, um, astronomy badge days with Girl Scouts and with Boy Scouts. And now I do with COVID a lot of online activities, the, um, Global Star Party with Explore Alliance and Virtual Star Party with uh, Universe Today and things like this. Good. Awesome. Well, keep, yeah, uh, uh, reaching a lot of people and you are an inspiration. So thanks for doing that. Richard Stearman wants me to ask you, um, I am under the impression that you have been accepted as an astronaut or is it the list for to become an astronaut? Yes. So, uh, yes, I actually know know, uh, Richard um, from from my last astronomy club and I I did apply to the astronaut program. They have pushed back the notification of who's going to be interviewed in the first round of interviews. So I've not heard if I have made the cut for getting an interview yet. Um, You know, it's my my first time around. I don't expect to make it this time around, but uh, I'm going to continue to apply into the future and see what happens. Okay. Uh, Well, yeah, the good luck. I mean, I think, um, I, I forgot the numbers now, but for just a handful of spots, I think uh, NASA in the last round got like 18,000. Is that right? 18, yeah, I think this year applicants? it was 12,000 applicants uh-huh. or something around there. Um, and I, think, <laughs> so, I think it's something like between like 12 and 20 slots. I don't know if they have a number decided for this round yet. Uh, so it's extremely competitive. I think yeah. I have a, a, a good resume for my age, at least. So we'll see what happens. Well, never... <laughs> Never has there been a better chance, though, for you to become an astronaut. I mean, look at the in the history of going into space. Uh, <laughs> this we we have more and more opportunities for going up there now. So I think that uh, this is the time to get involved. Certainly, I mean, I think what what did we have? Uh, Seventeen or maybe twenty, maybe two dozen astronauts in the Apollo program that had a chance of going to the moon, and then of course the space shuttle uh, had a, had a slightly larger group to choose from. And, and but now I think. Now is the time uh, where everybody wants to plan to go to Mars. Certainly SpaceX and Blue Origin at all are doing a lot of work to do to get us there. Um, mm-hmm. That reminds me about your career choice, though, being a physicist. And this, this sort of ties into your wanting to be an astronaut. What area of physics do you want to go into? So uh, I got to I got to work at one of the national laboratories as an as an intern when I was an undergraduate doing nuclear physics. So studying okay. the properties of atomic nuclei. And what I'm doing now for my PhD is I wanted to to bring that knowledge over with me, uh, but have it attached to astro in some way. So I've gone into neutrino physics, where 
uh, the physics of what's happening with the neutrino is very much on the nuclear particle side of physics, but we can learn a lot of astrophysics from neutrinos, like how the sun works and uh, what's happening inside of a supernova and things like that. Awesome. Okay. All right. Well, Chris Georgie is asking, I don't know if you know the answer to this, but I'm going to ask it anyway, because it's uh, interesting. He's going, do astro imagers still live and die by IRAF? Do you know what IRAF is, Molly? I, I don't. I'm trying to think of what that might stand I for. I can tell you exactly what it is. It okay. is an, an archaic, very, very old uh, software package that was maintained by the Space Telescope Science Institute and others. Mm -hmm. uh, the I think it was the uh, Harvard Smithsonian, or no, uh, Astrophysical Observatory in, in, in Harvard. It was a convoluted program that one used to process data from a variety of images and it was the main source of professional uh you could uh, photometry and things like that that you did it has finally i'm happy to say been retired um <laughs> i actually got to see it get retired when i was at the institute in favor of astropi astropi is the thing guess, everybody's yeah. using now um and so astropi is what most professional astronomers are using to reduce their data uh, and to process it in a variety of different, uh, from a variety of different telescopes. So the answer to that is happily, Chris, no, they do not <laughs> use that piece of crap anymore. Uh, Was it like written in Fortran or something? <laughs> oh boy, part of, parts of it were, parts of it were uh -huh. in Fortran, parts were in Java, parts were in, oh, wow. might've been in C. It was a hodgepodge, man. It was just a, a lot. And, it, and what made it worse is it had its own little language um, that you could use while you were in the IDE. And that was, that was, uh, oh, let's just move along before I get flashbacks on that one. Um, yeah, it was not, it was not, uh, not good. Um, okay. So, um, he, uh, Chris Georgie is also commenting, you can get decent shots with a barn door tracker and a cheap digicam that has a long exposure mode. This is back when we were talking about the mounts. Have you ever used one of those? It's just two boards with a hinge. Yeah. <laughs> yes, that's very true. I've not used a, a barn door tracker, but I I did get a Vixen Polary a, a, a few years back, and I've since acquired a Skywatcher Star Adventurer. And those are a lot cheaper than a telescope mount. They've run about 400 bucks for the whole package. And you can chuck your DSLR onto there. And as long as you don't try to go too long in focal length, uh, up to 300 millimeters maybe, you can do long exposure astrophotography of sections of the Milky Way, or if you're in the Southern Hemisphere, the Magellanic Clouds, or uh, uh, the Pleiades, a wide variety of, of targets that you can access with something that's not a super expensive telescope mount uh, or a super expensive camera. Uh, yeah. And barn doors are even simpler than that, where uh, instead of having electronics, uh, uh, you're pretty much tracking and right ascension using mechanical means. So, <laughs> yeah, and literally, I mean, the one I, the one that I had built was two boards with a hinge, all got from the hardware store, and a threaded rod that went through. Uh, one of the boards and and then uh, just pushed against the other one and as it opened the mm -hmm. polar axis was the hinge and you could just follow along with the sky that way it was uh it worked okay you could just turn the little knob uh was the one i used um nick hardy wants to know um have you ever tried the astro pixel processor i, I have know. not i uh, it's it's another piece of software like pixinsight oh and is it okay uh, it's 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 got its fan base and it can do some really amazing things with creating mosaic images. And we've had a few speakers on the Astro Imaging channel, which is a, a weekly YouTube show that um, I uh, am co-host for. And I it looks like a really cool piece of software. I just haven't used it because I'm I'm very deep inside Pix Insight now. <laughs> well, yeah, it sounds like a, that that program does just about anything you'd want. So once you've met mastered it it's kind of like when you've learned photoshop right you it does everything you want you've got the skills so you may as well keep at it right <laughs> yeah but yeah uh, a lot of people use app as well and uh, get a lot of good work out of it so it's another another contender okay all right um let's see what was my other question oh um on uh, clear skies network um uh, shiny pants 71 wants to know if anybody is shooting the <laughs> i love these handles uh anyone shooting the borealis uh he's got clouds where he is ah. so uh what about shooting things like uh aurora and more transient events like comets things like that um any special advice for that uh getting a good picture of the aurora so borealis? i've not had the 
privilege of imaging the aurora, although one of my one of my uh, friends from my last astronomy club, uh, he leads some trips up to Alaska to, to do that. Um, but for comets and aurora and those transient things, uh, don't use a telescope, use a camera lens and get a nice wide field. And uh, you just have to be persistent and wait for the conditions to be right, plan ahead and hope you get lucky. <laughs> And bracket your exposures. Yeah, I think that's just fine. Just your you know, yeah. <laughs> just you know, just get get a, get a nice uh, nice backdrop of mountains or something, real wide field, and just yes. uh, just take a bunch of uh, different exposure photos. Charles bon uh, Bonafilia on uh, <laughs> on Clear Skies Network is commenting: narrow band is the only ah. way. This is when we were talking about your your uh, your color wheel, uh, your filter wheel on your telescope. Um, you ever do much narrow band? And what is it? Why don't you tell people what it is? Sure. Here? So I live uh, just north of San Francisco. So there's a lot of light pollution here. And I'm sure the majority of you live in places that also have a lot of light pollution. And light pollution filters help. They can block out some of the uh, like like mercury lamps and, and sodium lamps that are common in street lights. But especially with the transition to LEDs, it's getting harder and harder to block that light. So what narrow band is, is it, it's uh, instead of having, accepting a wide variety of, of the color spectrum through them, uh, like, like wide band filters do, they select a very narrow strip of color, a very narrow part of the electromagnetic spectrum that is where there's a particular emission of light in an elemental gas that's out there in space. For example, hydrogen alpha is is known well known by astronomers, and it's it's one of the brightest. I think it is the brightest emission in the sky, and it's hydrogen gas that is excited by a star, and then as it as it de excites, goes back to its lower energy state, releases this deep red light, and that's the red light that you see in images of um, like in galaxies where you see the uh, the nebulae, or if you see uh, color pictures of the Lagoon Nebula or something like that, that's that red light you're seeing. Oxygen also has a very bright emission, as well as sulfur. And with these filters that select just that exact color and block out all the rest, and that's the way you can pierce through the light pollution and get really high contrast, really clear images of things in the night sky, even from the city. However, you're limited in what targets you can use it with because uh, you can only use it on targets that glow in those frequencies. For example, the Trifid Nebula has an emission region which glows in that nice hydrogen alpha, but it also has a reflection region that while it is blue, is not oxygen light. So if you were to image that in, in, in narrowband, you would only see the hydrogen and not the, uh, not the nice blue part of it. And so you can't reflected really see galaxies. So reflect right uh, because again they don't have they don't emit uh, in those. In yeah, there'll, there'll be some pockets things. of hydrogen, but right. you won't get a full image of the galaxy. And a reflection object like a reflection nebula, those would not also be very good for the same reason, right? They don't they don't emit in those regions that your filter is is sensitive to. Yeah, I mean they're they're emitting uh, sort of on a, on a narrow band like a particular frequency, the, the dust there is reflecting the blue light of, of the stars in the area, which is a, a broadband blue. So you, um, you're not going to be able to pick that up through an oxygen filter. Wouldn't it be great? And I, want, I, I totally want credit for this, and I want it to be called the Darnell filter when it comes out. <laughs> Wouldn't it be great if you had a narrow band a filter that is on order of a, of a couple, maybe, you know, a couple angstrom, angstrom's band pass, right? which I think a lot of the narrow, narrow band filters are. My earpiece just fell out. Um, wouldn't it be great to have a filter that you could just tune to any wavelength along the visible spectrum that there is? Imagine that. If you wanted to see, you know, these galaxies that has just a slightly, you know, they're emitting in a certain wavelength band and cut out all the rest. Now, the disadvantage to that filter is that you would also <laughs> be going through parts that light pollution is going to be there and there'd be some bands that are useless no matter what but wouldn't that be great if you could have a tunable filter that could select a variety of wavelengths for narrow band imaging it's going to happen it probably will happen there's there's some really interesting lcd technology that uh um that can do things like that although the transmission is still pretty low but uh then of course you run into the problem of having to take 
an enormous amount of images on every single wavelength that you want. Uh, like I know. <laughs> hey. <laughs> <laughs> but it's there, right? It, that's just <laughs> images, right? You just that's just you know clicking a shutter. That's all right. You don't need to worry about. That. Well, there there are filters that that do multiple narrow bands at once. So, uh, so this is these are especially good for color cameras because they they're made in such a way where they pass hydrogen and and the oxygen light, and some of them even pass a uh, uh, hydrogen beta, another hydrogen emission, as well as um, uh, sulfur, and. Those ones, of course, the more bands they pass, the more expensive they get. But there are filters that pass multiple narrow band bands at once. Well, yeah. Well, the triad filter is one example. Yeah, the triad filter, yeah. At, at, at OPT that they sell. That's that's one of that's the first example I've heard of someone doing it. Uh, it's not tunable, but it is in three wavelengths that you can uh, that you can get at narrow band wavelengths. So that's at narrow band passes. Uh, Chris is asking a lot of good questions. I want to try to get some of these. He's asking, are you doing inverse? Uh, inverse point spread function correction with that software that was still out of the realm of, avail of availability the last I messed with imaging myself. So I think he's referring to deconvolution here. And mm -hmm. that is, um, so if you've ever done any planetary processing, like in uh, Registax with images of, of Jupiter or Saturn, that's pretty much what you're doing. Uh, although in not as, not as in a different way, um, so, so for in PixInsight, for example, you you create a sample point spread function based on the stars in the image, and uh, there's some math involved in, in how that's done, and then you use that example that sample point point spread function image to apply deconvolution to the image, and that, what that essentially does is it sharpens it. It uh, kind of helps to remove after the fact some of the effects of the atmosphere, and that's what you're doing in planetary imaging as well, although since you have thousands of frames for planetary imaging, that process tends to work a little better on that front. Um, so yes, I do that for both planetary and some of my deep sky images, but you do need quite a few frames for it to work well, as well as uh, data that's not particularly noisy. So I tend to I tend to not even try if I have fewer than 75 frames in in the stack of the, of the image I'm applying the deconvolution to. Uh, you need a lot of frames for it to work well. Is that CPU intensive doing that convolution, deconvolution? Um, yes, yeah. So yeah. There, there's several steps that are uh, in in the stacking process that are pretty CPU intensive. Stacking itself, registering, uh, which is the aligning of the stars. Uh, I actually have a, a home built machine that uh, has a a pretty awesome CPU and graphics card and lots of RAM, so that I can process faster. Yeah, we, and and if. Everybody who gets into this eventually ends up with their own processing dedicated machine <laughs> yeah, yeah. at some point. Um, yeah, so uh, Nick Hardy is commenting, um, I stick to five minute subs. I could go longer, but then I have more chance of satellites and other things. Um, what do you think of that? So uh, I tend to stick to five minute subs for my wide band uh, for luminance, red, green, and blue, and 10 minutes on my narrow band. Uh, primarily because of light pollution and also because of the noise characteristics of my CMOS camera. However, don't let satellites limit you because part of the stacking process is not just averaging, but pixel rejection. And what right. that does is if you have a satellite trail going through one of your images and it's only in that one image and none of the others, or it's in a different place in another image, that's going to get, those pixels are going to be rejected from your stack. So that satellite trail is not going to show up in your final image. So don't throw out the frames that have satellites. You can use those with, even with Deep Sky Stacker, with, with any stacking software, we'll do, yep. we'll do pixel rejection. Very good point. And are you worried at all, then talking about satellites, are you worried at all about these uh, SpaceX style constellations that are going up right now? I'm, I'm somewhat worried. Um, I, I know they haven't really been taking seriously the measures to, to darken them. Although I know they've been, I've heard that they've been testing it. Um, from an, from, for me in particular, like as an astro imager, there are a lot of techniques I can use to, to remove satellite trails. And right now, when you actually see the Starlink constellation, it's because they haven't spread out into their orbits yet. Uh, like once they're all up, you're not going to be seeing those trains. But mm -hmm. They are still going to be coming through images a lot. There's already, there's already something like 2,000 satellites up there. I already get yeah. a lot of images. What I'm right. more worried about is the uh, is the scientific telescopes, the ones that have cameras that are so sensitive that if a satellite comes through, it actually destroys the data, and that that 
they can't use that. And especially if you're imaging something that's transient, like a supernova, you can never get that back. You can't just go image it the next night. Uh, I'm worried for radio astronomy. All those- Me too. We are, yeah, we're already a very radio saturated planet. We've got Wi-Fi, we've got you know actual radio and TV and cell phone communications. And that limits what radio astronomy we can do. And having 12,000 more radio sources up in the sky is going to make radio astronomy essentially blind. And we do so much science through radio astronomy. Like that, that black hole image that came out last year, that was done with the That's radio right. telescope. The Event Horizon Telescope. That's right. Yeah. That was uh, M87, and that was the, that was an actual event horizon of an actual black hole, and it took radio yeah, that's not a around the world image. to see it. Actual image. <laughs> that's right. That's right. No, you're right. You're absolutely correct. And it's funny because I, you know, there have been studies. The European Southern Observatory did a study. The uh, American Astronautical Society also did a study uh, on these constellations of satellites, and the general consensus is that there are a problem about 30 percent of scientific observations are going to be at risk uh, especially the wide field ones like uh, the vera rubin telescope uh, but the big problem will be s centered more or less around the dusk to dawn hours where right. the geometry of the sun the earth and the satellite is such that they get a lot of reflections down on the ground yeah. and that would be the dusk and dawn time period but there's nobody that's ever talked about radio yet. And that and yeah. that is the where I think it's really going to be a problem. I mean, you're absolutely right. All of these things can be maybe, I don't know, maybe they can be painted a matte black or something that doesn't reflect as much, you know, stupid mm -hmm. stuff like that. But what are you going to do about the radio? This thing's going to be loud as heck with mm -hmm. beaming down internet to the earth. They're going to be loud, bright, and all over the place for radio astronomers. I don't know how they yeah, can do it's it. It's like it's trying to hear a, a whisper when you're in a room full of shouting people. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, it's crazy. It's not very difficult. And it's not just the, the black hole observations that radio astronomy does. Radio astronomy does a lot of, of astrochemistry. We can know what's in the clouds that are in these nebula and look at chemical reactions that are happening in space that cannot be replicated on Earth because of the conditions here are different. And uh, there's there's so much science that's done with radio astronomy, and I mean it, it's it's a it's a tough argument because it's it, as much as it affects science, it's also going to bring internet to parts of the world. That I don't know, have to the internet, and that's I also know, I'm a torn. boon for science, you know. So yeah. it, it, it's you know I, I don't really come down really hard on one side or the other. I do worry, um, although there there is a protected band of of radio that nobody is allowed to broadcast on. But it's a very tiny <laughs> band, yeah. and we can only do so much science there, you know. Uh, so and until it, we get a radio telescope on the moon, uh, <laughs> it's going to cause a lot of problems. Yeah, I know. It's uh, it's the 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 the, the, the kind of work. I mean, I'm like I said, I'm 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 just with you on this because on on the one hand, I could see the problems for astronomers in our night sky. Just one more thing to take the stars away from us. But at the same time, I probably would become a Starlink customer, right? I mean, I'd yeah. probably like, I'd probably like buy it because I really need decent internet where I live. So I, I've kind of torn on it as well. Uh, mm -hmm. Charles Bonifilia from the uh, Clear Skies Network wants to know, for Molly, are you a manual processor or a fan of the new weighted batch processor? That's a and great maybe question. Maybe talk a little bit, maybe define those terms a little bit for people who don't know what that means. Yeah, so PixInsight has a, uh, well, the, the tool batch preprocessing has been around for a while, but now they have a weighted batch preprocessing that does one of the steps that was the initial reason why I didn't use it from the get-go, which is uh, the, the weighted part, uh, actually grading your images and using that, that weighting to make images that are better in your stack uh, more prominent and the images that are not as good to be a, a not as big of a component in, in your final stacked image. Um, I don't use it because so I, I was doing a I was doing a tutorial uh, for for a, a group of women astronomers that I belong to, and um, that that question was asked. And actually, no, this is when I was doing on on the Global Star Party. That's right. Um, and I don't like using it because I have data from many many nights. And while weighted batch preprocessor can handle data from multiple nights it's a lot harder to go through and match up. You know, I need these flats to go with, with these lights. I need these darks to go with these lights. 
And for me, with data that I have from many nights over a couple of months, it's a lot easier for me just to go through and do it by hand than it is for me to, to assign all the data correctly and cross my fingers that I did it right in with batch preprocessor. However, if you're relatively new, especially if you're new to Pix and Sight, if your data is mostly from one or two nights and uh, instead of being across several months, is definitely a tool that's that's worth using and could save you a lot of a lot of time and effort. Yeah, and eventually it's going to be mandatory. You're, you're going to be taking so many, so much data. I mean, big data hasn't gotten to the amateur level yet, but it will. Uh, you'll be taking gigabytes of data soon, and you won't you won't be able to go through all of it manually. And so you'll just need to you'll need to do some kind of batch preprocessing, I think. Yeah, I mean, I still go through it manually to because batch preprocessing, like like the weighting algorithm, doesn't always catch. Like if you have really long streaked stars, it won't always catch that. If you had some weird tracking error, so I still go through all my data every night. Although um, I have been kicking around the idea of figuring out an algorithm to better detect, uh, or I'm sure somebody's already got one, to better detect the longer streaked stars, so I can just toss those out from the get go. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, Nick Hardy wants to know what software you use for capturing images. I use sequence capturing. Yeah, so I use Sequence Generator Pro, and uh, there's there's other software out there, but it's one that that I started with, and I've got it figured out now. So I'm just going to keep using it. Um, it runs all my stuff. It runs the telescope mount. It runs the camera. It runs my focuser. It runs my filter wheel. It talks to the auto guiding software PHD2. It it handles everything. It can even talk to your dome if you have a, if you're so lucky to have a, a motorized dome, um, and pretty much all your devices. So I use I have two computers that I run th my three rigs on, and I run SQL Generator Pro, three instances of it to run a lot of stuff. Some there's one called Nina that's free and open source that has a lot of features in it that a lot of new folks like to use. Um, there's Voyager, which I have not used. That's a little more expensive than SQL Generator, but not a whole lot. Um, I have the SkyX. It, 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 it's mandatory to run the Paramount, but it doesn't really do sequencing. So I can't say like, okay, go to this target, use these filters for these exposures. Then go to this target, use these filters for these exposures. You can only oh, do that. that right? Wow. Oh, well, you think that'd yeah, be built it in. That's pretty sequencer. big. Yeah, as okay. big of a program as it is, you would think. But it, you know, <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> at the end of the day, there's no program that does all the things, even the really expensive ones like CCD command. Well, like, um, uh, ACP, for instance, there's no program that does all the things. So you kind of have to just use multiple pieces of software to accomplish all your night's work. I use SharpCap for planetary imaging and for aligning the telescope and polar aligning um, because it does a lot better at that than SQL Generator Pro does. So yeah, this got to use, there's no one software that solves all the problems. Yeah, that's true. Uh, at least not yet. Uh, T Hammer is commenting, we would never have made it to the moon without women in science. That's very true. Um, for well said. Chris, what is it with you in IRAF? So Chris <laughs> Georgie is going image reduction and analysis facility. If I'm recalling the expansion correctly, you are recalling the expansion correctly. That is what IRAF stands for. Thank you. Now I'm going to need therapy. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I make I make fun I make fun of that program because it was severely you needed to hold your mouth right to get to get it to uh, do stuff you wanted it to do so um, uh, yeah parts of it did I'm, but you know you don't understand Chris what we're still talking about IRAP. Uh you don't understand how, how that thing morphed uh, over the years uh, with various libraries and things i could be wrong it may not have had java in it it would be to its only credit that it didn't have java because i hate that too yeah, um java. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah I'm, and, I've you're, got and you're better idea. and you're better for it too yeah. um uh, so t hammer is asking what is the best size eyepiece uh what is the best sized eyepiece to take pictures of jupiter and saturn so, I guess so, he's talking about eyepiece projection. Eyepiece projection, yeah. So I have tried eyepiece projection, um, especially back when I had the DSLR and couldn't figure out how to attach my Barlow to it um, at the time, at least. And I I found that I got a lot of chromatic aberration. I mean, to be fair, I have not invested in eyepieces. I just have a set of plossels from Celestron. Um, so I was I got too much uh, chromatic aberration for me to like doing it that way. And since I have a Schmidt Cassegrain. There's other ways I can get magnification, like imaging at prime gives me 2,000 millimeters of focal length, which is what I'm going right. to be imaging the conjunction at. Um, I can also tack a, uh, I have a 2.25x Barlow, uh, a nicer one now, um, 
where I can really zoom in on on one planet. Um, so I don't I don't do eyepiece projection. It's it's too much glass between the camera and space, basically. Yeah, there's always a trade off, isn't there? I mean, you definitely want to not have as many refractions in there, reflections as you can. Yeah. Um, uh, Chris wants to know if uh, again if you have any spectroscopic capabilities. I do not. I, I do have photometric capabilities. I have a set of photometric filters uh, on my on that science rig, the one with the, with the eight inch Newtonian. Um, so I can so I have uh, the red, green, blue, and infrared photometric filters. But I I don't have a, a, a spectroscopic uh, capability yet. Although once I kind of like if I ever get bored of variable star observing, I'll probably get one of those uh, one of those filters that has a diffraction grading and and mess around with that. I think that'd be fun. A lot of people yeah. are getting into that. And the AAVSO does a lot of spectroscopy as well, if you're looking for a place. It, it, is, a, it is another area, I think, yes, and it, and it is another area, I think, where amateurs can get decent equipment and make valuable contributions. It used to be this was quite expensive. Uh, yeah, to get, yeah. Uh, those, those, like, there's one called the star analyzer that's not a real expensive filter. And it's really just a filter you drop in. It's not like a whole separate device so I mean, the resolution is not as good as having like an actual spectrometer, but uh, you can do spectroscopy by just dropping in a filter in front of your camera, really. So those there's two ways to do in spectroscopy. One of them is with prisms. Obviously, you can split light up with a with a refractive element, but there's another way with reflective. Um, um, oh boy, there it's like a mirror. Why am I drawing a blank on what it is? It's got small gratings in it that yeah, you, a diffraction grating. Thank you, thank you. A diffraction grating that uh, uses reflection instead of refraction to get those uh, spectra out, and it was the uh, the the ref reflective ones that a lot of professional uh, astronomers use um, to get their spectra with, or at least they used to. Um, okay, so uh, Chris is commenting that I believe there are tunable filters, but cost and size are a problem. Yes, and they also tune over a very narrow range. We're talking, yeah. I mean, for example, your H-alpha filter, we didn't even get yeah. Yeah. to solar astronomy. Um, your H-alpha filter from Lunt or whatever it is, you get one, Daystar, uh, those are tunable, but over a very, you know, tiny range. So, um, uh, well, let's talk, okay, let's, I, I, I hope, you have a couple minutes because I, I, I know we got, yeah. I promise I wouldn't take a lot of your time, but uh, can you talk a little bit about your solar observing efforts? What kind of gear yeah. do you have for solar observing? Because so, solar max is coming up. Yeah. So I, I wish I had a solar telescope, um, like, like, like the Lunt or a Daystar uh, cork or something like that, but I don't and they're expensive. So what I do right now is, uh, so I got, I got a sheet of Seymour solar filter paper that I actually won as a door prize uh, at like a, at an astronomy event. And I, I built a filter cell for my eight inch telescope out of cardboard and duct tape. <laughs> 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 and I covered I it with gaffer's tape, black on the inside and then white on the outside to help keep the heat out. And it's, it's an off axis filter because I didn't quite have enough filter paper to to safely cover the whole objective. I only, I only had like a quarter inch on the edges and I wasn't comfortable with that. So um, I made a, an off axis one. Actually, I've got it behind me. I was just using it the other day. Um, so this oh, okay. is the filter cell here. Um, I've got cardboard sheets on Velcro to, uh, to help um, protect the solar cell. And then this is just a, like an off-axis cell that's just a few inches across. But it so I don't have uh, as good a resolution as I would have. But it's it's still a decent amount of resolution, and I can do broadband uh, white light solar imaging, as it's called, through this. And I can't see prominences, but I can see sunspots and get some nice detail on the sunspots. Uh, so that's been really fun to do through my eight inch, and uh, with a, with a monochrome or a color camera. Yeah. Good. All right. Well, I guess I'm, I'm going to have to let you go. I really don't want to, but I, I get, thank you for, thank you for giving time uh, to, for our, for our podcast. Molly Wakeling was, was our guest today. She, you can follow her on Instagram at, at astromolly underscore images. Uh, that's her Instagram. You can also go to her website, astromolly, astronomolly.com. Astronomolly. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Astronomolly.com. And 
there, the shoulder. <laughs> yep, it's right there. But for those listening, <laughs> yeah. it's uh, it's the so please go there. Look, you can see all the uh, images of her gear as well as some amazing in, in her gallery. You can see some of the images that she's taken, and you can also interact with her there. I hope you would consider maybe another appearance so I can talk to you some yep. more. Uh, thank you so much for taking time out. You can also I would encourage you to also check her out. She's on weekly uh, space hangout uh, with Universe Today. She's also on the Astro Imaging channel on YouTube. So you can find her on all of those places. Molly, thank you so much for taking time out to be with us today. Thank you so much for having me. This was fun. Okay. On behalf of Dustin Gibson, who will be back in the next episode. And uh, Molly, I want to thank you all so much for listening. And as always, keep looking up. Okay. I am going to stop the stream. But when I do, um, I will also, st I want to hit the stop recording button on Zencaster. And if you see on that, that browser tab, you are uploading a file. Please leave that tab open until okay. the file is complete. And then you can go Perfect. from there. I okay. will, uh, I will stop.